So as of recording, it's two hours, maybe three hours. I know I can do the math. It's that many hours until the next episode of Severance comes out, and you bet your damn freaking bippy that I'm doing another fan art thing, this time of the macro data refinement process. If you haven't seen the show again, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. And if you do watch the show, you'll understand why this is a uh, exciting project. So uh, this is a completely procedural recreation. I tried recording this before on my good computer, but it failed. This is this show? So now we're, we're going MacBook mode on the bed, okay? Let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. We're gonna talk about them later. It's gonna be a geometry nodes-based project. So I'm gonna make a basic geo nodes group, and the name of the game is basically spawning a bunch of points in a grid, maybe in a four by three screen resolution, where each point inherits a random number. So maybe this is a nine, this is an eight, this is a seven. The whole basis of what I want to do is use the strings to curve node because what this lets us do is type in any number. So like one, two, let's make sure that uh, this is centered, three, four, and even better, if I use a value to string to uh, convert inside of here, I can now put in a custom number that will be turned into a string. So for example, if I wanted to show the time in seconds as it plays, it's now kind of a clock in some sense. Now, I don't want to just use the default numbers, no. If I can choose numbers and letters and all this, I want to use the best font in the game. I already know the name of what I'm looking for. I believe it's called the retro computer. Yeah, I like this because the numbers are very like pixelated, but it's not like an alarm clock kind of thing. So let's download a font and put it on the desktop. Now, I believe it's as simple now as I choose the font and there you go. Now it's gonna look a little weird, but that's because it's pixelated, right? So if you only see the perimeter, it's gonna look weird. This is a curve object. I'm going to fill that curve and now we have numbers again, which when they look tiny, uh, won't look so strange. So all of this can be considered our number generator where we input in a uh, number and it draws something. Now the next order of business is making a screen full of them, really just a bunch of dots. And it might not be intuitive to you, well, I hope it is, but a grid is the best way to do this. The reason is a grid isn't just like a square, but it's composed of a bunch of loop cuts, a bunch of edges and points and all this, that I can make denser and denser and denser, where each point, or you could do each face, represents a, a number. So what you might be tempted to do is you instance on points a number, which are all overlapping, so I'm going to make a much, much smaller, and that does work, except now we have all the same number, whereas I want each number to be, like, randomly generated. Now, the observant among you might be, okay, just put in a random number, what's the big deal? The big deal is this takes in a single input, and any field we put in, whether it be the index or random number, is not going to be compatible. So somehow, for each point, we need to instance a number, but, like, independently from each other. Well, here is a trick. Assuming you're using the newer versions of Blender, and you should be, they added a for each element zone, kind of like the simulation zone and the repeat zone, except what this one does is it does the same process for every single element. So in this case, every single point, or you could have it be every single instance, whatever. So I'm going to hook up this grid, and I want to say for every single point, that's what this element is, do a certain instruction. That instruction is going to be drawing this number, so I'm going to use this as the output. We don't look at the first output, but the second output which is actually, here's what's happening here, for each element, for every single point in our grid, of which there are 169, I believe, it's going to be drawing this number, although it's always going to be a 12 or, you know, whatever number I set it to, and they're all perfectly overlapping. So there are actually, if I look here, there are actually, where is it? 169 instances. They're just all perfectly overlapping each other. So what I want to do is I want to, yeah, say, spawn a number for each element, but at the position of that point. So here's how we're going to do that. So for each element, I'm going to sample the index. What that means is I'm going to take our singular point and look at index zero, because that is going to be the only single point that separated it. And I'm going to extract its position. And then all I need to do is transform or place the letter at that location. Now, if I make this smaller again, we've basically recreated the same situation, although now there's going to be one big difference. And that is that we can put in a single number over here for each element. So for example, I could put in the index. And you can see once they're not overlapping, I've basically made a grid that shows the index of every single point. And if I can put in the index, you bet your mother frickin' bippy that I can also put in a random number. So I'm going to take a random integer between 0 and 9. Those are all the uh, single digit um, integers. Again, we get this issue, which goes against what I was saying. Uh, but the key insight is for this uh, index, you can set it to the ID. So basically what I'm saying is, yeah, pick a random number, but I'm constraining it to this one and only index. So I'm going to make this like a four by three grid because it's, you know, the aspect ratio of like an old computer monitor. And you can choose like how many numbers you want this to occupy. So it's nice and procedural. I don't know, like a 10 by eight kind of feels correct to me. It's not too cluttered. 
And now uh, the name of the game to make it look like the severance thing is to play around with the scale, but in a way that respects like a cursor that can move around like somebody's navigating their mouse. I'm just going to start off simple and not animate it. So this empty is going to be our cursor. And if I drag this in, it actually comes in as a object info node that I'm going to set to relative. So we now know the location of this empty. And what I want to say is for every single point, so maybe this one that spawns a zero, its size should be determined by the distance, right? So points that are very close, I want them to be very big, whereas points that are far away, big distance, you know, make them tiny, almost like we're highlighting an area. And I'm asking what is the distance between the empty location and the position of the point? <laughs> To actually affect the scale, by the way, outside of this uh, transform node, a easy trick is we can just add a scale, either scale elements or scale instances probably makes more sense. We can uh, scale instances and then use this distance for the scale. Now, again, this is the inverse of what we want, but you can see it's proximity dependent. So I'm going to take this map range and instead of going from zero to one, I want things that are close to be a one and things that are far away to be a zero. So there you go. Of course, these numbers are stupidly small. So I'm going to make it so that at minimum they're a uh, one and they can get as big as, I don't know, a six seems kind of scary big. Let's do a four and a half. Yeah, now we have this nice control over it. And at this point, the thing that makes it look old school and cool and all of this is layers of randomness and things that don't make look so uniform because right now it just kind of looks like I'm like an ocean wave showing in numbers. Uh, so the first thing is I'm going to limit the proximity of this because you see the fall off is very slow and gradual. Take the furthest it looks out a distance of one and make that much tinier. So let's say it only looks 0.3 units away. All of a sudden it's only highlighting certain numbers that are within the uh, proximity. I'm also going to make this interpolation either smooth step or step linear. The interesting thing about step linear is you get this kind of popping motion that I think is very cool. Whereas with um, smooth step you you get kind of a nicer gradient. So it depends if you want it to be like a low FPS or a high FPS. I'm actually going to do step linear, which wasn't my original approach. And let's do it at five or even six steps, just so it's a bit smoother. And now let's add in randomness. So instead of only looking 0.3 units away, which will kind of make a uniform circle where everything on the circle is about the same size, then everything on this circle is a bit smaller, kind of like ripples on water. This in itself should be randomized. And you can either use a random number to do that or a noise texture. I'm going to start off with a random number and just see what that looks like. So instead of 0.3, which is uh, what it was by default, and you can see now it's like behaving much uh, more chaotically. Instead of 0.3, let's say you could look as close as like 0.15 and as far as 0.45. And now we get this kind of, I don't know, this kind of behavior that seems a bit more interesting to me. So I'm actually really excited about today's sponsor, which is Squarespace, because I've done a full website redesign recently at cgmatter.com. And because I'm pivoting from Patreon to this personal site where you have all these exclusive tiers, Squarespace has been something I've been using daily for a while now. Here are three features that you are going to love that I actually love. The first one is the Asset Browser. This is what lets you host videos and images, and I'm using this all the time, and I get to keep all my media in one place. Second of all, they make payments super easy, which again is important important because I'm trying to run this Patreon-esque thing, which involves payments, whether it be PayPal, credit card, whatever. And thirdly, when it comes to designing your websites, they do have an AI feature for writing a lot of content and there's templates and all of these kinds of things. So head over to Squarespace and, you know, design a website. And when you are ready to take that and launch, you can use this link in the uh, description to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And additionally, I don't want all the big numbers to go to the same size. I don't know, some of them should be able to get even bigger, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. So so for this maximum size, instead of a five, this could also be random. Yeah, let's also use a random number. It could go as little as four or as high as, I don't know, six. And honestly, I am liking the look of that. Like in my original, I did all this thing with like taxi cab metrics and things to break up this circular pattern. But honestly, just a few random numbers does it for me. And I want to remind you that all of this is procedural in the sense that, oh, we can add more numbers if it doesn't feel dense enough. So it could be a 12 by 10 or like generate, you know, new numbers and all of this. And now that we have our mechanism, another thing, and in fact, to me, the defining thing that makes the uh, severance macro data refinement screen so ethereal is all the numbers are kind of wiggling. They're almost alive. And that may have something to do with its actual purpose. We'll find out in episode three, maybe. Although I think we already know, spoilers ahead, reconstructing the brain, going back to Kier and all this. Uh, but the things wiggle is the point. And that can also be easily, you know, accounted for where instead of scaling instances, I instead move them. And notice we now have this nice control where it almost looks like we're scrolling, uh, which is super cool. 
Uh, but for this translation, I'm going to randomize it, this time not with a random number, but something a bit more continuous, like a uh, noise texture. Specifically, I don't want to just plug this in right here, but you're going to see it kind of like shifts things up to the like up and right. And additionally, it's going to mess with our Z coordinates slightly because noise texture goes from zero to one on, you know, X, Y, and Z axes. I'm going to center it by subtracting a half. So now it's going negative five to 0.5. In other words, it's not going to like shift upwards uh, the way it was before. And additionally, I would like to multiply this whole effect in a way that uh, the Z is suppressed. So this is before and after. You see we have some jiggle in the numbers. And because they are animated over time is let's use a four dimensional noise. It's basically the same thing, but it has this like seed value, this W slider. And I'm going to attach the time in seconds. So now they wiggle uh, easily. In fact, if they wiggle too much or too rapidly, I can multiply this by 0.1, which will effectively make them wiggle uh, 10 times uh, slower. Now, one thing I'm noticing is there's this occasional popping. What if I put it like here? There we go. So I don't know if you saw it, but there's this occasional getting bigger and smaller. And that's because the distance is getting evaluated after the translation occurs. So maybe this is one argument for not doing it. Well, what if we do something like this? Before we move it, I'm going to capture this information. So instead of just putting this into the scale, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this like thing we calculated and store it. And that is what I'm going to send after the fact. So we're just kind of doing a bypass over here. And now there should not be popping, but still that nice like wiggling uh, behavior. And now that we have kind of the basic logic down, let's make it actually look like the uh, severance screen. I'm going to make it black and white, and then you can dye it blue or like green later. I'm going to need a white material. I'm going to need a black material. For the black material, I don't want any of this to be lighting based, so I'm literally going to connect nothing in here. And then in the white material, I'm going to do kind of the same thing, but actually put in a value. So it can have a value of one, which represents white, uh, zero is black. And then even though we have this material kind of applied, notice that it doesn't really show up or uh, do anything here. Like it's supposed to be pure white. And the reason for that is geometry nodes is weird in the sense that you apply the material kind of like as a node. Say make them white. I'm just going to make sure that we have a standard color transform. So this is before and after just gets a bit brighter. Once we have this, let's make a black background that we could do with a material or let's just take the world color and make it black. Let's see what that looks like. And to me, the next obvious thing to do is we need a um a cursor i mean we have the cursor logic but it doesn't look like there's a mouse on the screen so i'm gonna need to go hunting because i don't have the image i want on this computer that looks pretty good let's see what's the default file format what is this does it even say i honestly don't understand how macs work to be perfectly honest with you i mainly use my pc i got this for like uh, compatibility reasons where i want to test certain add-ons or whatever uh but let's try this so i'm going to add in a mesh plane this looks good to me this uh, web p and by default it's going to use principle again I don't want that. So it's one of these. I'm going to try mission. I'm not sure. What does this give us? I think that was actually correct, right? So this is a cursor whose material, what does it look like? No, it still uses the principled BSDF. So the two pieces of information I care about is I have the color of the cursor and I have this alpha channel that lets me isolate the uh, background. So I'm going to make a really simple material. It's just going to be the color. And then I'm going to mix in using this alpha um, really a transparency shader, but I just want to show you what this is doing. This is letting me kind of isolate the foreground and the background here with this alpha channel. So I'm going to make this transparent. And now we have this nice mouse that in itself isn't affecting anything, but the smart ones among you probably know where I'm going with this. I'm going to take this cursor and I'm going to make it really tiny, maybe something like that. And I'm going to parent that to the motion of the empty. So this way, uh, when we move the empty, it looks like we're moving the cursor. Now, I want you to notice that I'm doing this kind of 3D compositing. We have our black layer, we have our white layer of numbers, and then above that in the Z axis, we have our cursor. Hit this auto key uh, button. What that does is when I play now, it will record what I'm doing. So I'm like inspecting a number, is this one right? And is it here? Like that. And uh, you can see, once I disable this, it's uh, stored all this uh, motion data. So now it's actually, you know, real uh, cursor motion. What else do I want to do? Well, I want to add a layer of of UI. I saw an image online where there was this Lumen logo and the four tempers. I wonder what it's like to watch this video not knowing what I'm talking about. And I wonder what it's like to wonder what it's like to think about it talking to a camera. Uh, what was I looking for? Severance UI. I kind of like that, you know, minus the blue. I do like that. So I'm going to save this image and I'm just going to use this as an overlay. And you might be wondering, how am I going to integrate it in? Don't you worry. I'm import in a mesh plane. This one's going to be the UI image. Let's try shadeless this time. Maybe this is correct. Eh, 
Not really. Well, I don't need to get complicated. So for this plane, I'm just going to use this UI. So instead of having this blue, which again, we can tint later, I'm going to have everything be black and white. So I'm going to convert this to a black and white image. And it's kind of very dim color ramp, bringing up the blacks and then bringing down the whites. So it's high contrast, but doesn't like break anything. And this uh, we want to put over our numbers. So something like that, where we get rid of uh, the center information, right? I don't want these numbers. I want the uh, numbers I made. Easy, easy, easy. All we need to do, no shade or anything, just go into edit mode, add a loop cut at the tip add another loop cut at the other tip. Isolated this face, which I can now delete. And now if I put this even further above the uh, cursor like this, we now have another layer uh, to our UI. So I'm just gonna kind of bring this up maybe make everything a tiny bit wider. So now I have my numbers and they're perfectly within the UI. Most of the effects you do after this point, you can do in like basic compositing, like this pixelation, the glow of the screen, whatever. But to isolate it, I'm gonna add a camera that will kind of work from the top view like we are now. It's important that it's the top view because our layers are stacked uh, vertically, but there's actually some perspective. It kind of looks 3D. In this case, that's not what I want. I wanna make sure everything looks flat as if we're looking from a bird's eye view orthographic style. As if, um, as if you know, we took this camera and made it orthographic. This will make it so that there's no perspective. And I'm just going to zoom in with this orthographic scale until it takes up the screen. And then I'm just going to adjust the, the something resolution, the X resolution. Yeah, I mean, that is our very nice UI. And I guess one interesting thing you can do uh, that I didn't do in the original is if you want scrolling behavior, like I'm trying to access numbers that were over here, what I can do is I can make the numbers that would have been here, almost like we're extending the display and then only looking at like a tiny window. I can take this grid and stretch it. So I'm gonna make it twice as wide. And then to compensate for that, I need, I believe twice as many on the X to keep the same density. Can I just transform these? Does that make sense? I think it does. It doesn't like re-randomize the numbers. What I wanted to say is now I can access numbers that were from a different part of the screen. Let's see, the cursor right at this section kind of has this deliberate motion to the right. So this would be a good opportunity to keyframe. So I'm gonna keyframe, go a few frames down and access that information we couldn't see before. Keyframe, I'm gonna set interpolation to Bezier. I hit T for somehow that stands for interpolation. I don't know. Uh, but we can go into the graph editor, normalize this. So here you can see the curve uh, of what's happening, this like X translation. You want to take both these handles and you want to scale them to make them like nice and long and smooth. But the issue is they don't like scale relative to themselves. They like stick to their center point. I'm just going to set to individual centers and now they scale in place. Like it looks like nice and smooth and deliberate. Now really the only thing we need to fix is, you know, there's some numbers pop in, in and out here, um, which by the way, I mean, you don't have to be too smart about this. You could just have it take this section and just kind of extrude it. Well, let's literally extrude it on the Y axis. So I'm just extruding a, a chunk of black. Yeah, you don't need to be too clever about this. Okay, what do we have so far? So we're looking through numbers and then we go to the right of the screen, then we keep going right. Amazing. As for compositing, I don't really want to get into it. I'm not in the mood. But just to give you an idea, let's render a frame. And here's like some basic ideas. What I would do is I'd go for like this like CRT look. You could take a glare node and set it to like bloom or something bring down the threshold. So this is what's gonna let it glow, especially the uh, big numbers. And I'm gonna make it much like subtler by making it negative, in other words, weaker. So already we have kind of like the glow of a screen. You can definitely get the curvature of a screen using this lens distortion node. So as I increase this, you see we get that curvature. Hit fit. You can also add a subtle dispersion, which is the colors kind of breaking on the edges. Let's do like a shadow filter, which makes it look super like crisp and kind of like, I don't know, retro tech like. And like already this was our original, this is our new. You can bring a lot of life into this quite easily. By the way, if you wanted to dye the screen, just mix color and multiply. In other words, dye the color yellow or the color green or the color uh, blue. Tell me the recording didn't freeze. Okay. I honestly am impressed that the MacBook Air could do this record be on battery, it's not even plugged in, and I think it's pretty smooth. So might make more tutorials with this thing. Either way, if you want to get the original project file that I showed you, I might make some modifications to it uh, since then, but you can head over to www.cgmatter.com. That's my like Patreon-esque platform where you can get the uh, blend file. You could have seen this tutorial early, by the way. There's also um, early access to uh, videos and there's my last five, six, five years of project files there. For $5, you can get everything. Yes, I do have a Patreon and they are identical, but I prefer that you go to www.cgmatter.com because that way I get more control over the platform and I get to write better posts and all of that. So thank you for watching. And uh, I keep forgetting, I think the episode actually comes out in two and a half hours where I am. So get excited. Enough time to edit, really.